This is me having my early morning coffee in my favorite coffee shop around this place. I like it there. You probably recognize this place. And you probably have another place like this, right? It might be another coffee shop. It might be your workplace, home, any place you like to hang out, work, relax. And this place is actually very close to MIT, uh, which is my workplace now. And I usually go there with colleagues just to brainstorm or simply to socialize over a cup of cortado, as you can see there. Sometimes I even meet new people, okay? And I strike up conversation, running some ideas to them or just to know what other people do. But after going to this place for a while, I noticed a couple of things. The first one is that despite being in the world center of innovation and research with millions of visitors in the area, I constantly see the same faces. And most of the people in that coffee shop is very similar to me. I'm not talking about the laptops or the phones. They even share the same jobs, the same interests. And I have the same feeling of a social media, my coworkers, my neighborhood. Same faces over and over. So how come that we are constantly seeing the same faces and interacting with the same people in our lives? The reason is very simple. It's really simple. It's that we are creatures of habit. Opportunities to meet new people are bounded by our daily behavior, our daily routines. Home, work, school for the kids, weekends, barbecues, games. We keep repeating our behavior over and over, doing the same things, going to the same places, and seeing the same people. Actually, during the last years, we have been studying how you and I interact with new people. We have done that using massive data sets about how we communicate over phone calls, text, social media. For example, here you can see I downloaded seven years of my Gmail history. And I started counting how many new interactions, how many number of successful interactions I was doing per year. And by successful interaction, I mean that there was an exchange of emails between that person and me back and forth because there was a task involved, not just simply receiving or sending an email. And I found something intriguing. The number of people I was interacting with was growing at a constant pace. And it's not only me, all of you. Our research shows that all of you has a constant pace in which you create new interactions. Of course, that new interactions that you create are because of this flow of interactions that you get from family, from friends, from the neighborhood. Also, this pace, this constant pace, changes slightly due to life and work events. And it's actually higher when you're younger than when you get older. By the way, men seem to create, on average, 15% more interactions than women. Okay? You can see here that something happened in my life in 2007, right? I went from creating 140 new interactions per year to just 110 interactions per year. Guess what happened? Anyone has an idea? What? Oh my, no, no. <laughs> easy voices. I got a real job, a, a permanent job. I went from knocking on everybody's door and networking a lot to choosing and picking who I wanted to interact with. But the more fundamental thing here is not this change is that if you have this constant pace and you can estimate it, you can evaluate today how many people you are going to interact in your whole life. And I did this calculation 10 years ago, and I'm still on track. I'm going to interact with 5,000 people in my life, in my professional life, from my 20s to my 60s. 5,000 people only. And I have the same feeling also in the cities, how many people we encounter in the cities. Of course, these people that you encounter in your cities are also your friends, your family, your co-workers. But they are also all these people you happen to be like familiar strangers you see in the school, you see in the neighborhoods, right? During September 2016 to April 2017, and using data coming from mobile phone applications, we have studied how 83 million people move in the U.S. Actually, in 11 metropolitan areas in the U.S., for example, like Boston, New York, Miami, or L.A. Or LA. And by the metropolitan area, I mean not just the city, but all the suburbs and commuting zones which are economically tied to those cities. So for example, in the Boston area, we include large parts of New Hampshire. Specifically, we wanted to know how many people you encounter in your life, how many people you share a small space, a small physical space, for at least half an hour. Okay. 
these are the people you are interacting or you could be interacting in the future. Okay. And since we are requiring them to spend a, um, a while with you in a small physical space, for example, these people are the ones sitting next to you today. But they are not the ones you passed by on the street when you came here because they were not sharing a space with you for a while. And we also found that because of our behaviors, our routines, our repetitive behaviors, we end up meeting only 5,000 people per year in a city. That's the only people you are going to encounter in your life in a city per year. 5,000 people. It looks a lot like we are living in a small village, right? It's actually so small, this number, 5,000, that it's hard to picture, right? But let me try. If you go to the Gillette Stadium to attend a game, and the stadium is full, there are 66,000 people there. And 5,000 is just the people seated in the club seat section, which is this red shaded area. This is the people you are going to encounter in the city per year, and it's only the people you are going to interact with. So you might have the impression that your inboxes are full, that in social media you have limited number of contacts, and you can access everybody in Facebook in the world two clicks away, right? You can also have the impression that everywhere you go in the city, you are surrounded by thousands of people. But at the end of the day, just, you are just going to interact with 5,000 people in your life. And you are just going to encounter 5,000 people per year in the city. 5,000 is a small number, but it could be enough to accommodate family, friends, even a successful career. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's, a, it's a big number for that. It could also be a big number to build strong, healthy, and diverse communities in our cities and our societies. But we have a problem. My experience in the coffee shop tells me that most of the people we interact with are very similar to us. Same interests, same jobs, even the same educational background, even the same income group, and even the same political opinion. So we are isolated, living in our small villages, but we are apart. And isolation is actually at the root of segregation, a problem which is especially important in cities. In fact, economic segregation today is higher than in the 70s, and by some metrics, stands at levels not seen since the Great Depression. In fact, uh, the percentage of Americans living in a middle-income uh, neighborhood has dropped from 65% in the 70s to just 42% in 2009. And economic segregation has an enormous cost, not only for the people that are living in those poor areas, but for all the residents in the cities and for the region as a whole. For example, the top 1% income group live 10 to 15 years more than the bottom 1% income group. Children that are exposed to more distressed neighborhoods have worse educational outcomes, and higher levels of segregation are related to higher homicide rates and a slower economic growth. Actually, segregated areas tend to be less innovative in the future. Actually, the relationship between innovative companies and inequality is very special. Higher uh, inno uh, innovation in an urban area means that we will have higher inequality in that area. And the reason is very simple. Inno innovative companies tend to cluster together, pretty much what is happening here in Kendall Square. Because of that reason, a highly paid, highly educated individuals tend to come to this area to lower their cost of living, right? This pushes away low-income workers for the area. And this effect is aggravated by the further gentrification of the area because we build Whole Foods, coffee shops, gyms in the area, and that pushes away further low-income workers. Actually, the cost of living is, coming, is becoming one of the major problems that innovative companies have to attract and retain talent. Elon Musk said that SpaceX opened an engineering office in Seattle just to attract top talent that refuses to live in LA because of the cost of living. So you want to change this. You want to change, um, you want to change this cost that segregation and inequality is having in our societies, in our companies, and in our cities. We have to start by understanding how and specifically where segregation occurs. A common misconception is that most of the people you are going to meet in your life lives in your neighborhood. This is why most of the policies and most of the interest is placed on neighborhoods. But our data tell us otherwise. 
most of the people you are going to meet in your life doesn't live in your neighborhood. Actually, only 25% of the people you encounter daily lives in your neighborhood. We fill the rest of our small villages in many different places, especially the ones which are related to work, errands, and lesser time. Let me show you an example. This video, I'm going to show you how people move downtown in Boston on a typical day. Each point is an individual staying in that location for more than half an hour, and the colors indicate the income of the neighborhood they live in. At night, and sometimes during the day, you're going to see people staying home. But when morning starts, people from many different neighborhoods and many different income groups get together in areas like, for example, the medical area, shopping centers, the financial district, the airport, even, for example, the university, or here, for example, in Kendall Square. You can also see some other areas in which there is only one color. That means that those chance encounters between people of different incomes do not happen. To help us and you and other people understand how this is happening in our city, how isolation is happening in our city, we have built an online tool that you can navigate, which is called Atlas of Inequality, in which we investigate how those encounters happen in our cities. By dividing the city in small areas of just 80 feet by 80 feet, we have produced the most detailed map of how encounters happen in our cities. This is actually how the tool looks like around the place where this talk is happening. And if you wonder, you are here. <laughs> so once again, each of the areas here is 80 feet by 80 feet, and the colors indicate the economic diversity of the people that visited. Red indicates that people from many different income groups get together in that place, while blue means that people from only one income group go to that place. You're familiar with this area, and I guess that most of you are familiar with this area. You will see that there are some red areas that you can identify easily. There are Kendall Square, some restaurants, and some uh, coffee shops. And if you look carefully, you can really see other places where those encounters do not happen. But don't worry, because I'm not going to mention any company names here. <laughs> but the most astonishing thing in these maps is the following. Close to a place in which we can find people of many incomes, many economic backgrounds, we find a place which, is, which has very small economic diversity. And by close, I mean from one place to the one next door. Even in 80 feet, we can see this difference. Even across the street, we can find a place that has very different economic diversity. So this means that we are sharing the same physical space, literally the same physical space, but yet, by making these small choices of going to one coffee shop or the other, we are keeping away people, and we are living together, but we're living apart. This means that uh, part of the problem of isolation of economic groups in the city is encoded into our behavior, into our choices, not where we live. We fill our small villages in many places, and by making these ap small, apparently inconsequential decisions, we are keeping away people that are just 80 feet away, 80 feet away. As a result, and probably unintentionally, our behavior is in part responsible for isolation of economic groups in the city, magnifying the problem of segregation that I said has this tremendous cost for our societies, for our companies, and for the residents of the city. So how can we change this? How can we uh, decrease the segregation and the isolation that we see in the cities? Well, this problem is really complex. It has many nuances. I'm not going to solve it here today. I'm just going to advocate for a very simple solution to mitigate the problem that you don't encounter people different than you. Please cross the street. <laughs> just getting across the street to another coffee shop could impact the people you see every day and can actually uh, minimize the divert also by maximize the diversity of people that you encounter in your daily lives. I know, I know what you're thinking now. Well, I'm too busy. I mean, I cannot actually go to another place. Or even if I go to that place, will it change something in my life? Will it have any real impact in my life? I know, right? But let me tell you something that is also in our data. If you change just 1% of your behavior, I'm asking for one hour of your time per week, okay? If you just change this, just this 1% of your behavior and you cross the street, you go to another coffee shop, another restaurant, or another venue just across the street, you can have a 5% increase in the diversity you see in your lives. 
This is a five-fold effect of just one hour of your time. Okay, so I did it. I went to another coffee shop. <laughs> actually, this is another coffee shop which is very nearby, and it's actually only 200 meters away from the, from the other coffee shop that I was showing you at the first. A, a place that I knew will have different people than the one I usually encounter in my favorite coffee shop. Of course, I still go to my favorite coffee shop. The cortados are so good <laughs> that I cannot give them up. But every now and then, my 1% of the times, I cross the street. I go to another place, a place I know I will encounter different people. Is it still too early to know with this 1% of my time is impacting in my real life? But at least I know that I'm diversifying the people that I encounter every day in my lives. And this is just me. But with the right interventions, we can change enough people's behavior by that 1%. So we can decrease isolation and segregation in our cities. City planning can take into account these metrics so we can see how people's behavior changed when new zoning or new construction is happening in our cities. Think about place recommendation algorithms. They could be modified to optimize your ability to find different people than you. By the way, company campuses are becoming more and more embedded into the fabric of our cities, right? Most of the cities proclaim the creation of innovation districts, like pretty much like Kendall Square, where thousands of employees share their small villages in a really tiny place. Some like Google, Apple, or Facebook, are expanding the campuses. They don't call it small cities, but they are small cities. And since creativity and innovation are linked to the diversity of our interactions, imagine what that 1% change of behavior could have, uh, what is the impact of that change of behavior in your businesses? The creative development of your employees does not stop in the office, on, at the office door. So how can we change this 1% of behavior so our interactions are more diverse within and outside our companies and therefore more innovative? Cities are changing dramatically. By 2050, two thirds of the population will live in a city. And it seems that segregation goes hand in hand with us un that unstoppable growth. Good news is that part of the isolation that I show you is embedded in our behaviors. So we could easily change it. Tonight in this room, we have innovators, decision makers, and also executives whose decisions impact not only thousands of employees' behavior, but also that of billions of users and customers. So imagine how can we change our cities if you help us implement this cross the street 1% strategy. There are only 5,000 seats to your life, only 5,000. Make them count, for you, obviously, but also for our companies and for our city. Please, cross the street. Thank you. <laughs>